Welcome to another video. This two part series is going to be a little different from what I usually do in that it won't really discuss any technicals, but focus more on economics and investing. Also, none of this is investment advice. I only invest because I believe in Bitcoin's future and the facts on which I base that belief will be laid out in this series. Also, I won't cover um, any of the details of how cryptocurrencies actually work. So if you're looking for that, check out 3Blue1Brown's video in the description. Recently, I was asked why I was buying Bitcoin and why I thought it was a good investment. To answer this question, I prepared a two-part series. And in this part, we'll go over how cryptocurrencies came to be. In the second part, I'll elaborate on why I think some of them are a good investment, particularly Bitcoin. To understand money, let's go back 7,000 years to around 5,000 BC. The totality of the human population is around 40 million. Back then, people bartered. Bartering is like trading. You exchange goods and services for other goods and services. If a corn farmer wants a pig, he will try to trade with someone who has pigs, offering corn in return. The problem here is that it's difficult to agree on the amount because there isn't a set price, a standardized rate of exchange. Another problem is the coincidence of wants. If the pig owner doesn't want any corn, the farmer won't get his pig. So we need something that the pig owner deems valuable on its own. Many cultures around the world started using commodity money. Objects that have value in themselves as well as value in their use as, mo as money. Think of seeds, salt or tobacco. The settlement our farmer lives in has come to agree to use these things as a means of payment. Instead of bartering, one pays in this commodity money, which the other party can then use to buy the things he wants. We have now tackled the problem of the coincidence of wants. The corn farmer can pay the pig owner in an agreed upon number of seeds. But another problem arises with the use of commodity money. Most of these commodity monies were troublesome to store, as well as highly perishable. They didn't really store value well. It was also still very difficult to measure the value of various goods and services in commodity money. Around this time, metal objects were first introduced as money. Metals are durable, easily divisible and portable, and thus a much needed improvement. However, because it's difficult to measure the value of some pieces of metal, say impure gold, ancient cultures took it a step further. By 700 BC, the Lydians became the first in the Western world to make standardized coins. Countries around the world soon fo followed by minting their own series of coins with a specific value their nominal value. Since we now have coins with designated values, the cost of goods and services can be measured and compared against each other, so they become a unit of measurement. The durability of these metals also made them great for storing value. Because Lydia had developed a currency, the pace of its development through trade skyrocketed, and it soon became the richest empire in Asia Minor. The saying as rich as Croesus refers to the last Lydian king who minted the first gold coin in the world. Now these coins started out as really valuable in themselves. They were mostly minted from precious metals, like gold or silver. But as time went on, cultures started using less precious metals to mint their coins, while keeping the nominal value intact. These new coins weren't really as intrinsically valuable as gold coins or silver coins, but they represented the value by the number on their sides. In the 11th century, China took the developments of currency even further with the introduction of paper money. Now the distinction is even clearer. Paper doesn't hold any real value, but it represents value. We have now come into the era of representative money. The evolution of money, we, as we have described now, didn't really happen at the same time all around the world. Europeans were still using coins all the way up to the 16th century. But soon we all got there, with the necessary improvements compared to ancient China. Inscriptions went from those who are counterfeiting will be decapitated to in God we trust. Representative money was backed by banks and soon governments promises that could be exchanged for a certain amount of silver or gold. The old British pound sterling, for example, could be exchanged for a pound of sterling silver. For most of the 19th and early 20th century, most currencies were representative and relied for their value on the gold standard. In our modern world, Currencies are no longer bound to the gold standard. We are now living in the era of fiat currency. In 1971, Richard Nixon decoupled the US dollar from gold, and the world soon followed. 
Now, the only reason a currency has value is because the government maintains its value. Money as we now know it is a social agreement. It is no longer backed by a physical commodity, but by the government that issued it. In the previous part, I highlighted a couple of key terms throughout the story. These were the three functions of money. They are store of value, a means of payment, and a unit of measurement. Let's take the US dollar as an example. Firstly, it's a store of value because you can be relatively certain that the dollar will hold its value over time without depreciating too much. In the case of fiat money, this requires trust in the government issuing the currency. A currency that would have failed in this regard is the Venezuelan Bolivar, with inflation exceeding 350,000% in 2019. The means of payment speaks for itself. The US dollar can be used to purchase various goods and services on the market because the transactional parties agree to its value. Finally, we have unit of measurement, also quite obvious. The cost of goods and services is measured in this currency. Software is eating the world, including money. Almost every transaction today happens digitally. In 2019, e-commerce was responsible for about $3.5 trillion in sales. And as this forecast suggests, it's going to continue rising. The drawbacks of the form of digital payments that we use now are that every transaction is monitored by a trusted third party. This means that the third party can look into your financial activity, can refuse and reverse transactions, and in the most extreme cases can even confiscate funds. This is the biggest problem of centralization. It's also a big difference with cash. Cash is peer-to-peer, -peer, private and non-reversible. There's still some trust involved though. You have to trust the government that backs the currency to not devalue it through too much inflation. The problem with cash is that it has the annoying property that you have to be in the same place to exchange it. A few people saw that the world needed electronic peer-to-peer -peer cash, like David Chom with DigiCash and Wei Dai with B-Money, who was even referenced in the Bitcoin white paper. But almost all of the attempts failed. That is, until in the midst of the 2008 financial crash, a paper was published under the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto, titled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Bitcoin was the first project that tackled all the problems that several other digital cash projects had failed to overcome, the biggest of them being the double spending problem. I won't go into detail here, but it's a problem that arises when trying to cut out the controlling middleman of digital money. The idea is, if digital money is just a string of bits, can't I just copy my transactions without anyone noticing? Without any middleman, middleman to control all this, it becomes a hard problem, but one that was solved by the Bitcoin project. With the rise of Bitcoin, a lot of different projects followed, and out of them came a lot of different cryptocurrencies. Most cryptocurrencies run on a blockchain, the piece of technology that allows for all the revolutionary properties that these digital currencies have, like non-sovereign and decentralized, open source and transparent, censorship resistant, and peer-to-peer -peer and essentially private. This means that people can transfer wealth between one another without needing a third party for verification purposes and without having to worry about borders. Fees are therefore relatively low since there is no, party, uh, no third party to take a cut. The only fees you pay is to the network, which works to verify your transactions. Businesses won't get cut off by payment processors since there are none. It's an all-inclusive network. You don't need to verify your identity, disclose any financial information or pay to be able to participate in this new financial system. You only need an internet connected device. Remember that around 2 billion adults worldwide are unbanked, which means that they have to pay huge fees to companies like Western Union to send money overseas. Cryptocurrencies can help with that, especially now that it's becoming easier to get a smartphone than a bank account. A believer would say that these currencies are simply the next step in the evolution of money. For the first time, not governed by a government or bank, but by computer code and cryptography. Take away the human element and you take away the chance of corruption or mistakes. I hope I have provided you with enough information to be able to discern for yourself whether you believe it or not. You can find in the description the sources and some additional reading should you wish to dig deeper. In the next part, I will take a less philosophical stance 
philosophical and political stance and talk about why I invest in Bitcoin using facts and figures. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching.